The annual meeting of the UN General Assembly usually comes and goes without that much notice, but not this year. President Obama, Palestinian President Abbas, and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu will all address the world government body this week. Then Abbas will request that the UN Security Council approve Palestinian membership in the United Nations with full recognition. Whatever happens, the world will never be the same after this week. We'll explain further during this edition of Politics and Religion. Look, there are two things I don't discuss, politics and religion. In my house, we don't talk about politics and we don't talk about religion. I'll talk to you about anything except politics and religion. I never talk about politics and religion. Politics determines how we'll live here on Earth. Religion determines how we'll live forever. I'm Irvin Baxter. I think it's time we talk about it. Well, it's a big day for the United States of America and also for the world because what's happening is the 66th UN General Assembly convened today. The annual meeting of the UN General Assembly opens today with more than 100 world leaders gathered to discuss a wide range of issues, including the Palestinian statehood application, the future of the post gaddafi Libya, and non-communicable diseases. Now, this is the agenda that has been set for the United Nations. Uh, however, it's interesting that you have over 100 heads of state. There are only 192 in the entire world. So over half of the prime ministers, kings, and presidents will make their way to this global forum, which once a year gathers at New York in order to see to be seen and to express their opinion about the state of the world and what should be done about it. Now, this week is going to be an absolutely momentous week. Uh, President Obama tomorrow will address the United General Assembly, United Nations General Assembly, uh, as the U.S. president always does since we are the host country, the U.N. headquarters being here in the United States of America. And then on Friday, both Israeli uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas will also be addressing the United Nations. This is going to be a very sharp debate, I'm sure. Uh, it will be the time for Netanyahu to defend the nation of Israel and the fact that the two-state solution can only be achieved by negotiations between those two states. Mr. Abbas is contending that they've tried negotiations for 20 years and have not been able to reach an agreement. Therefore, he wants to leapfrog over the negotiations and go straight to the United Nations, recognizing the United Nations as a global government of sorts. And of course, this certainly feeds the ego of the United Nations. However, what's not being said and what Mr. Netanyahu, I'm sure, Mr. Netanyahu, I'm sure will say is that, well, we've been negotiating in good faith, but just because we would not give the Palestinians every single thing they asked for, they're saying that the negotiations were not fruitful. It is true that we're not willing to give them every single thing they asked for. They're asking for every inch of the ground back after they picked a war with us in 1967, and then we uh, conquered uh, our Arab neighbors during that war. We won the victory, and then our people began to set up homes in all this area, including the reunification of Jerusalem for the first time since 70 AD when the Romans drove the people of Israel out. So I'm sure he's going to be making all of these statements and saying that even UN Resolution 242 and Re Resolution 338 calls for the border to be negotiated, not unilaterally determined by the United Nations. Now, what's interesting is we already know how this turns out. Those of you that know the prophecies of the Bible, you can open your Bible to Revelation 11, verse 1 through 2. It says there that the Temple Mount will be placed under a sharing arrangement. So apparently the United Nations is not going to unilaterally say, yes, East Jerusalem belongs to the Palestinians and that will be their capital. Apparently that's not going to happen. 
out of this session this week. Now, what a tremendous advantage it is to have the prophecy of the Bible. Now, we do know, though, that the area of Judea is going to be endangered and that all Jews who remain there will find themselves not too long from now in a situation where they have to flee for their lives. That's another thing we're told because of the prophecy of Jesus Christ himself. So the prophecies open the window on the future. Even the delegates that will be meeting at the United Nations, they do not know what you know about the future. We also know that whatever they do now and whatever they do in negotiation, that too is going to break down because we know that ultimately the United Nations is going to invade Israel and that's what will trigger the Battle of Armageddon. So there's going to be temporary settlement of some sort, then something's going to be wrong and that's going to uh, give the United Nations a, uh, an excuse to invade the nation of Israel. So that's where we're headed in all this. Now, it's also interesting, there are many other discussions that are going to be held there. One of the things they're centering on is how to go ahead and recognize the transitional government in Libya. Now, the United Nations made up in its mind a long time ago that Gaddafi had to go and that the Libya was going to be remade in the image of the United Nations. So they are rushing, even though Gaddafi is still loose, he's still fighting, they're already saying uh, the Gaddafi era is is over and we are going to recognize the transfer of the United Nations seat from the Gaddafi government to the rebel government, the new transitional government that has now been established with the help of uh, world government forces called NATO. Uh, th these are three things I cannot emphasize enough. It's so important for us to realize that out of the Libyan exchange in particular, we've seen three very frightening world government structures assert themselves. One, the responsibility to protect. Now that's the UN's claim that they have the responsibility to go into any nation where they feel like the people are endangered because of a ruthless or unreasonable government. So they claim we can go in, you know, if we pass a resolution, to approve of ourselves going in. I mean, isn't that sort of convenient? You pass the resolution to approve your own actions. About anybody could fill that role. And then after we assert the responsibility to protect, that gives us a premise for invading a sovereign country. And the word sovereign no longer applies because there are only five sovereign countries left on the face of the planet. And we even wonder about those. Those five are the United States, Great Britain, France, China, and Russia, because those are the only five that have veto power over the United Nations decisions if the UN decides they want to invade your country, top of your government, and replace it with a government and more to its liking. So responsibility to protect has really come to the forefront of international politics during the Libyan conflict. In addition to that, the International Criminal Court continues to get higher and higher profile billing. The ICC, first of all, issued a warrant for the arrest of Mr. al-Bashir back in March of 2009. Well, now they've done it again in the spring of 2011. They've now issued a warrant for the arrest of Mr. Muammar Gaddafi. So if they can find him, he will be hauled before the International Criminal Court and placed on trial there for crimes against humanity in the way that he dealt with the uprising within his country, the way he put it down, they felt like he used too much force. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what they expected him to do. At the same time, Mr. Gaddafi, we can't say that he was a saint or anything like that. But at the same time, uh, we know that Mr. Bashar Assad has been much more ruthless. It appears that the death toll in his country is approaching 3,000 people now and still rising. That's not over yet. So number one, responsibility to protect. Number two, the international criminal court is now claiming the authority to issue warrants for the arrest of any king, president, or prime minister that would uh, dare to oppose the edicts of the UN Security Council. That's number two. And number three, the United Nations has really not had the muscle to back up its edicts until now. 
Now, all of a sudden, it is being recognized globally that NATO is the military arm of the United Nations, as it's being so graphically illustrated in the Libyan conflict. It's no secret that NATO planes and NATO soldiers, even on the ground, have been in there leading the charge against Muammar Gaddafi. So now, all of a sudden, the world government claims the right to use this very, very powerful military force called the North Atlantic Treaty organization now uh, being placed at the disposal of the United Nations. So big, big developments, all of these things. These things were not really that true this time last year. The world is changing big time, much of it because of what they call the Arab Spring. So it's very interesting to see as world government sticks its head up, asserts its its muscle, and that is what is happening. So consequently, Mr. Ban Ki-moon is playing a very significant role. He now is the leader of this one world government called the United Nations. Is he the most powerful force in it? No. That's probably Barack Obama at this particular juncture. Who knows who it will be this time next year. So those are some of the things that are happening. Also today is the day that... Don't ask, don't tell, is suspended in the U.S. forces. It has been all over the news today, one military person after another coming out of the closet, openly declaring, I am gay, and saying, I don't have to fear for the first time in my life. This is causing an upswelling of sentiment toward repealing the Defense of Marriage Act. So they're never satisfied. They're never going to be satisfied. Uh, They are determined that we will accept marriage between two men and marriage between two women as a legitimate union. But ladies and gentlemen, how distorted can you get? Now this brings up a question, though, that's very important. Should we persecute gays? We know that the Bible is adamantly against homosexuality, both Old Testament and New. Not just the Old Testament, both Old Testament and New. We know the Bible is adamantly against it. It calls it perversion. It calls it unnatural. Uh, But the next question is then how do we treat them? Should we persecute them? Should we favor them? Should we pass laws recognizing their ability to marry and give them the same legitimacy that a man and woman marrying has? Well, number one, I don't think that Christians should persecute them. I don't believe Christians should be hateful to them. Treat them as though you were in the process of winning them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's the right attitude to take. At the same time, though, We don't have to roll over and lay down, lay down and roll over while they attempt to brainwash this nation into believing that two men can be married or two women can be legitimately married. When the Bible clearly defines marriage as one man and one woman, the Bible defines it. I'm talking about in the very beginning. I'm talking about the first man, the first woman. This is so central to human life. That the very first man and woman, God said, I make them male and female, and it is good for this cause will a man leave his father, his mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So that's what we're facing today as the homosexual agenda celebrates what they see as a great, great victory, and they're determined to push it on until the whole nation gives them the stamp of approval. Big day here at Politics and Religion. Maybe you've listened to Politics and Religion for years, and every time you hear us talk about End Time's free weekly e-newsletter, you say to yourself, today is the day I go to endtime.com and sign up. But the teacher from school calls, Junior's sick. Your husband texts you a picture of the mailbox that Susie ran over while learning to back out of the driveway. And as you try to get out of the door, your boss is waiting for that detailed report that was actually due yesterday. All of a sudden, convenience is not on your side, and now the e-newsletter is the last thing on your mind. We now offer an easy-to-use feature that is perfect for those of you that have little time to spare. 
Just text the word end time to the number 22828. It's that easy. Text E N D T I M E to the number 22828. That's E N D T I M E to the number 22828. William Koenig is the author of Eye to Eye, Facing the Consequences of Dividing Israel, in which he contends that America's 12 costliest hurricanes and two largest terrorism events began within 24 hours of U.S. presidents applying pressure on Israel to trade her land for promises of peace and security. Are each one of these record-setting events just a coincidence or awe-spiring signs that God is actively involved in the affairs of Israel? Find out on Tuesday, September 27th on Politics and Religion. Tired of the same old boring TV? Tired of the not-so-reality TV? We have the answer. Tune in to the exciting show that keeps you up to date with current events. Hope. Meaning. Answers. That is the message that Urban Baxter's End of the Age series represents. You can tune in every Sunday on Daystar at 10.30 p.m., Mondays on the Church Channel at 9 p.m., or tune in to TBN on Wednesday mornings at 7 a.m., all Central Standard Time. Get informed today. Please listen close. Constant Contact, who is the service that we use to send out our weekly e-newsletter. Apparently, some addresses became old. We were not informed of it. And consequently, they are requesting, matter of fact, requiring that we resubscribe all of our e-newsletter subscribers. That means if you receive our free e-newsletter, that you must resubscribe in order to continue to receive it. Or if you don't receive it but would like to receive it, again, there's no charge at all, uh, then you need to go to endtime.com, and there's a place there for subscribing to the newsletter. Now, to all of you that were, were already on our mailing list, we sent out a request that you would resubscribe If you did that, then you're good to go. That'll be fine. And by the way, if you have not seen our e-newsletter, you will be impressed. I mean, I don't do it. Uh, We have people here on our staff that do it, and I have been impressed because every week they list articles that have direct association to the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Bible. And it's so interesting to read. So I would encourage you, if you would like to subscribe to our e-newsletter, simply go to endtime.com. And that way you can uh, click on the uh, place there to subscribe to the newsletter and you can subscribe. And that will make sure that your name does not get eliminated. Uh, One more thing I want to talk to you about that I'm really excited about. it. We're continuing to gain. Seems like we're gaining about $2,000 a day for some reason. And that's we'll we'll soon be there because we're now $14,200, just slightly less than $14,200 away from our goal of $120,000. So we're still gaining. Our total today is $105,827.66. So we're excited. We only have $14,200 or so to go. If you'd like to help us go over the top, now's the time to do it. Jump on the bandwagon. What this means is that the Understanding End Time series, 14 hours of the most important prophetic teaching in the Bible, will now be in the eight major languages of the world, and 90% of the world will be able to hear these things. Now, the Bible teaches that these prophecies will be unsealed in the end time. Well, it just dawned on me a few days ago while I was attempting to raise the budget in order to translate all this into the languages of most of the people of the world, that these teachings, even though they're now available They're only available in English. That means they're still sealed to everybody except English-speaking people. And I realized that with this translation from English into the major languages of the world, over 90% of the world will be able to hear and understand. That means this has been unsealed. The Bible says in Daniel 12, 9, these words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Well, guess what? This project, it looks like to me it's a direct fulfillment of that prophecy. 
because this project is unsealing this so that the people of the world can hear about it. And furthermore, we're also putting it up for digital download anywhere in the world that there's an internet connection. So we are excited. We are, I, I don't know when anything has caused me to be more pumped about a project than this one. So thank all of you that have made it possible. Uh, there's still uh, $14,800 to go. So if you're out there and you want to push this thing over the top, let's do it. And I appreciate you all so very, very much. Uh, we're talking today about the UN General Assembly that opened Today, they're going to be talking about the number one topic, of course, is the uh, the granting of U.N. membership to the Palestinian uh, entity. If that should happen, uh, many people think it's going to be a major train wreck because if you don't, it's going to be trouble. If you do, it's going to be trouble. Uh, it just goes on and on. So uh, all this week, it's going to be drama after drama after drama. It's going to be very interesting to hear the words of uh, President Barack Obama tomorrow. Uh, he has to try to straddle the fence. At the same time, he's got a Jewish vote that he desperately needs when he runs for president next year. Oh, by the way, uh, there's some pretty big articles out there suggesting that perhaps he should not run for president again, that he's simply going to be defeated because his presidency has been such an utter failure as far as the economy goes. And they're actually urging him to step aside in favor of Hillary Clinton. I, I've been shocked at this taking place. I don't know where it's going to lead. Of course, it's not unprecedented because back when Lyndon Baines Johnson had so much trouble with the Vietnam War, what was that, 1968? Finally, he came under so much pressure, he stepped forward and said, I will not be running again. And then, of course, uh, Robert Kennedy declared his candidacy. But then he was shot after Johnson said, I will not run again. And it ended up being Hubert Humphrey gaining the nomination for the Democratic uh, presidency at that particular time. So it's not unprecedented that because of the sad state of affairs, a presidential candidate could feel like he was forced to step aside. Don't know whether that's going to happen or not. I would be surprised. And yet at the same time, the approval ratings for Barack Obama right now are absolutely abysmal because the job situation, the economic situation is just so bleak. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Of course, there's uh, there's a lot of time to make up. Uh, a year is a lot of time. We do want to get to your phones now, though. And uh, calling from Oklahoma, uh, Don, welcome to Politics and Religion. Hello, Urban Baxter. Hi, Don. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing just fine. I want to make two quick comments, and then my question is, if you get a time frame on when Abbas and Netanyahu are going to speak on Friday, I'd appreciate it if you'd put it on your daily program. And the second comment is, I wonder if Ariel Sharon, shortly after he forced all those people out of Gaza, he had that massive stroke. I wonder if that was God uh, taking care of him. I don't know. But my question is, in... Uh, Revelation 12, verse 14, and the, and the women were given two wings of the great eagle that she might fly in the wilderness. I can't help believe, despite all the rhetoric that's going on right now, that the, as I do believe that, uh, as in your uh, America in the uh, Bible prophecy that we are for me, that uh, America will still be behind Israel and, and during this time of the Great Tribulation. I'll hang up and hear your comment. Okay, Don. Uh, well, of course, America is the eagle. America, the eagle is not included in Revelation 13, which is where the world government beast is depicted. The eagle's wings have been omitted. They were included in Daniel 7 when all the powers were yet separate, and yet when they merged together into one, the eagle's wings are gone. So I, like you, in believing and hoping that we will stay out of the world government structures and po possibly remain Israel's faithful friend uh, all the way to the end. So I'm certainly hoping that that will, in fact, be the case as well. Um, just such interesting things happening uh, when the Bible talks there about the eagle defending Israel. It does look like that the United States 
will in fact remain true. We don't know that for positive, but nevertheless, that's what is going on there. And uh, my screener may help me here. I The rest of your questions sort of slip me, so I'm sure they'll come along and sort of prompt me a little bit, unless you're still there, Don. But uh, I got to talk about the other thing, and your, the rest of your question temporarily slipped me, so I'll get back to that as soon as it, com- as it comes back to me. Uh, now, we're talking today about the United Nations convening today about the request that will be made this week toward the recognition of the Palestinians. And, you know, if they were just asking for recognition, Israel would probably vote for it. But what they're asking for is recognition within 1967 borders, and Israel has 550,000 people living there. Uh, So it's very important for us to realize that it's the 67 borders and East Jerusalem is the capital that causes Israel to be so adamant against it. Another part of the question that Donna asked was when Ariel Sharon withdrew from Gaza, which is part of the promised land, uh, then a few months later he experienced a stroke. Did I believe that was God's judgment? Well, you know, I'm pretty careful uh, about saying something is God's judgment. I've I've got to take care of myself without worrying about everybody else. However, it has been interesting that almost every single Israeli prime minister that has made a decision to withdraw from specifically described promised land from God's mouth, from God's own mouth, that they have been removed from office. I think every single one of them within one year. Uh, whether you talk about Yitzhak Rabin, whether you talk about Shimon Peres, whether you talk about Benjamin Netanyahu, he agreed to give away 22% of the West Bank back at the Y River Accords during his first prime ministership, and then Ariel Sharon. So uh, I'm not willing to say, it's not my place to say, at the same time, he did something I would never do. If I were prime minister of Israel, I would never, ever agree to give away one inch of the promised land. You say, but what if the U.S. puts you under pressure? Well, the U.S. can't put me under near as much pressure as God can put me under. And if the U.S. puts me under too much pressure, God will put them under pressure. I mean, there is a God that's a lot stronger than Barack Obama, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, no matter who you, what politician you want to name. We're not dealing with a mere man here. We are dealing with the God that controls the wind and the rain and the universe. We're dealing with a God that puts kings up, puts kings down. I mean, sometimes we have people that are so afraid of other politicians. Uh, the Bible says that we should not fear men, but we should fear God. So it's, it's that important. I um, think we got time. Let's go to our next question. John calling from right here in Texas. Hello, John. Hi, Irvin. I hope you can hear me. I can very well. Uh, I'm going to take it completely off topic today, but uh, this has been laid on my heart, so uh, I've been wondering to ask this question for quite a while. Uh, You know how the Bible talks about, you know, in the days of Lot? Well, we're living that today, I think. Yes. And uh, how about where he says, uh, sorry, I'm a little nervous. Uh, where he talks about uh, in the days of Noah, is there like going to be giants in the land again or well, weird well, mythical creatures? Yeah, John, what Jesus said was, as it was in the days of Noah, and then he explained what part of the days of Noah he was talking about. He said they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, and they were given in marriage until the day that the flood came. Likewise, so shall people be marrying and intermarrying, uh, marrying, given in marriage, eating, drinking, until the second coming happens. So he specifically says what part of Noah's day that he's referring to there. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're most welcome. And that's an important point, too, by the way, uh, because, uh, you know, when we, we read the Scripture, we got to look at it carefully because the Lord usually tells us specifically what he's talking about. United Nations starts its 66th annual General Assembly meeting today. We'll be back. 17 million Shanghai, China. 13 million Moscow, Russia. 20 million Mexico City, Mexico. This is the population 
of just a few cities that currently don't have understanding the end time. But imagine the billions of people in places like Paris, France, Rome, Italy, Cairo, Egypt, and many other cities throughout the world that currently need the end time message translated in their language. Irvin Baxter has a burden to get the end of the age series, understanding the end time, translated into the eight major languages of the world. The translation project will take a total of just $120,000. If you'd like to participate in reaching the world with this message, call 1-800-363-8463. Your gift of one, 10, or $50 will make a difference. Call 1-800-END-TIME or visit endtime.com to help reach the world with the end time message. Do you ever hear the news and know that something's just not right? Do you ever read about politics and think what is going on? Maybe you wonder what all this means for you and me. Well, we finally have some answers. Irvin Baxter has a 12 lesson series called Understanding the End Time that has aired throughout the world on TBN and Daystar. This series contains lessons like United States discovered in the Bible, Islam and Bible prophecy, and the seven trumpets. The Bible says in Daniel 11:33, they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Would you like to be one who understands end time events so you can instruct your friends and loved ones? If your answer is yes, then don't miss out on understanding the end time with Irvin Baxter. Call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463 and request your copy of Understanding the End Time. Other important things that are pending right now. Uh, the top U.S. intelligence official is in Ankara, Turkey, to head off a naval clash and to bring Palestinians to talks. Here's the story. U.S. Director of National Intelligence James Clapper arrived in Ankara on an urgent surprise visit Sunday night, September 18, as Turkish saber-rattling threatened three major U.S. interests. Sunday, Turkey's foreign minister said the information gathered by the U.S. radar system to be stationed in Turkey's Malatya province as part of the, of the NATO missile shield would not be shared with Israel, thereby disrupting the entire system. Monday, U.S. Noble Energy began drilling gas off Cyprus in defiance of Turkish threats. And Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas headed to New York to promote UN acceptance of a Palestinian state with Ankara's encouragement. Now, Turkey finds herself and likes it there, front and center, on the world stage right now. Let me tell you what is actually happening here. Clapper was in Turkey for a last-ditch Obama administration bid to avert sea and air hostilities erupting between Turkey, Greece, Cyprus, and Israel. Can you imagine if Turkey attacks Israeli ships? goes on to say this would take place in the eastern Mediterranean where tensions have been building up over Turkish threats against offshore gas exploration by Israel and Cyprus. Now listen to this closely. Ankara leaked tough new instructions issued by the uh, Erdogan government to the Turkish Navy to pin pin Israeli warships inside their 12-mile territorial waters and disable the weapons of any vessels sailing beyond that limit. Now, this says that Turkey plans to disable the weapons of any ship beyond the 12-mile limit. Are they saying that Israel can't have access to the open seas, that they're going to actually disable their weapons if they do? That's an act of war, ladies and gentlemen. So definitely boiling. We have all kinds of hot spots in the world, Libya. Syria for certain, and now then, Turkey is determined to try to tell Israel, you cannot 
mine this, these gas deposits out here because that's 60 miles out. They say within tw- after you're beyond the 12-mile limit, we're going to disarm your, your boats. So is that really a threat to Israel? Well, Israel has a powerful army, probably more powerful than Turkey. However, Turkey has about 80 million people. Israel only has 7 million people. That's a huge difference in power base. So what will happen? Well, President Obama has sent Mr. Clapper to Ankara trying to defuse this thing before they get to the United Nations. It's my understanding that President Obama actually has a meeting scheduled with Mr. Erdogan, who is the head of Turkey at this particular time. So Erdogan is attempting to gain control of the Arab world and to establish Turkish influence in that way. See, I don't think Turkey's that important. Well, you better think again because Turkey was the center of the Ottoman Empire for what, 400 years or so? I don't recall exactly, but a long time. And the Ottoman Empire ruled throughout the Middle East all the way up until World War I when they were defeated by the British. So the Ottoman Empire has been very powerful and hasn't really been out of power that long, and there are undoubtedly dreams of a restoration to grandeur by the Turkish government. I want to back up now because we've got to talk about don't ask, don't tell. If you're listening to the radio today or to television or whatever, you're undoubtedly being subjected to a barrage of pro-gay propaganda. Uh, And they're pounding away, saying this is so wonderful that gays will finally be given their civil rights. They have continually painted the right to be homosexual, openly so, as a civil right, and the right to same-sex marriage as a civil right. Now, civil rights are devoted to people who are the way they are because they were born that way. So consequently, this issue hinges on the belief that gays were born that way. Now, the lie has been repeated over and over and over again. Of course, we know that in Nazi Germany, uh, they had a way of repeating things over and over and over again until finally the whole world accepted it as true. And we've been hearing over and over again, gays are born that way. They do not choose to be gay. However, I have known a lot of people that have transitioned over a long period of time from being heterosexual in their lifestyle to being homosexual in their lifestyle. I know what happens. Whenever people are heterosexual but they are immoral, they begin to experiment beyond the bounds of marriage and they look for another exciting thrill and trying something new, trying something else. And it goes on and on. And then they resort to pornography. And straight pornography after a while just doesn't do it for them. And so now then they've got to go into more perverse forms of pornography. And they feed on that until the spirit of that enters into them. And they become convinced that they've always been that way. Now, that's the process. I've watched it happen. I mean, I had a young man in our church in Richmond, Indiana. This young man loved the girls. I mean, he was crazy about the girls. However, his mother dressed him like she would have dressed herself. She dressed him feminine. And he was so close to his mother that he developed feminine type personality traits. So guess what? The girls weren't attracted to him because girls are attracted to males and males are attracted to females as a natural course of things. Well, after he flirted with one girl, after I mean, he drove the girls crazy. He liked them so well, but none of them would give him the time of day. And I was afraid that what happened was going to happen. I saw him being rebuffed repeatedly, but I didn't know how to get it stopped And three or four years passed. He had left our church, moved to California. I heard that he was gay, that he had adopted the homosexual lifestyle. Don't tell me he was born that way. I watched him drive the girls crazy. 
But he moved in that direction because of a mother that was not wise that pulled him so close to herself and she taught him her effeminate traits until finally he made his switch in his own self-concept and became homosexual and ultimately contracted AIDS, very sorry to say. Now, I want to talk about these things in a loving way because if you're out there listening to me today and you have either been in the homosexual lifestyle or you have flirted with it, I want to tell you that the first thing you need to realize is that God says it's wrong, both Old Testament and New Testament. The Bible says in the Old Testament, if the man lies with mankind as with womankind, he has committed an abomination. The penalty in the Old Testament was death. However, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul also talked about homosexuality in Romans chapter 1 plus many other places. And he plainly said that because men, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful. Consequently, God turned them over to a strong delusion that they might do those things which are not convenient. And it says that men moved away from the natural love of the woman into that which is against nature. And then there are many other places in Scripture that specifically say, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse 9 through 11, it says there, Be not deceived, neither fornicator, nor adulterer, nor effeminate, nor homosexual shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now notice it doesn't just call out the homosexual, it calls out the adulterer too. It calls out the fornicator too. God made intimacy to be between a man, between one man, one woman. It was designed to bind them close together plus to produce a family. The family is the building block of all society. It's a wonderful thing to see a man and a woman faithful to each other, raising their children. The children are healthy and well-adjusted. It's the way God intended for things to be. I remember when almost all families seemed to be that way. However, as immorality invaded the American way of life, I have watched society become so dysfunctional. I have seen society uh, be infiltrated by drugs, by divorce. Uh, the broken homes are just heartbreaking. And it's all because we go away from God's definition of morality to a humanistic definition of morality. You say, well, where do we get our standards from? From God, from God's word. You forsake that. You can go get married to a dog or a cat. And why not? I mean, what says that two men could be married and a man and his dog couldn't be married? What's the difference? Well, a person being with a dog is is unnatural. Don't tell me that two men together is not unnatural. It's as unnatural as it can be. They can't have children. They can't build a family. They like to talk about the family, two men and a family. That's so twisted. That's so perverted. We have The Bible says men becoming, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I hear college educated people talking about two men, two women making up a family. People have become so educated, they become fools. Now, I know I'm, I'm speaking very openly today, but let me tell you, you've been absorbing all day. If you've had your news on, I had it on. I've been listening. You've been absorbing all day this perverted diatribe of, oh, this is the, finally the American spirit openly accepts this. What will we accept next in the name of open-mindedness? Somebody said, well, I, I take pride in being open-minded. Let me just caution you, you can get so open-minded that your brains fall out. You can be so open-minded that you lose all your moral values. Rome got really open-minded and decayed and disintegrated. Technology, technology, technology. I know what you're thinking. It isn't for me. 
Some I've heard say it's only for geeks. Well, not anymore. Digital downloading has become quite simple so that for all of us not so up to date with technology can do it with a breeze. Whether you're snowboarding in Alaska or climbing Mount Everest or just simply sitting with some friends who think they know all the answers to Bible prophecy, you can now download tons of product from all your technical gadgets. Don't even ask me to name them. Go to endtime.com day or night and in a matter of minutes, guess who looks like a genius? Your friends will be speechless. Go to www.endtime.com. That's E-N-D-T-I-M-E dot com. Click on shop and you're in business. Don't delay, download today and become a part of the End Time Geek Club. Death, destruction, poverty, war, disease. These are only some of the things that are ahead in the end time. Want to know more? Join us in reaching out and informing the world that over 2 billion people will die. We as a nation can't hide from this. We have to tell everyone we know about the prophesied war that will start from the river Euphrates. Call now to get your copy of World War III and spread the message that the end time is now. Call 1-800-END-TIME. Can't get enough of politics and religion? Well, neither can we. We have some great news for all of you Bible prophecy gurus. Think pre, no, not pre-trib. Different subject, pre-show. Urban Baxter will be teaching the end of the age series. Here's what you do. Just log on to endtime.com slash radio Monday through Friday at 2.30 p.m. Central Time and click on the live webcast button. Cha-ching, more Bible prophecy. How confusing having a pre-favorite, favorite show. We feel your pain. Call 1-800-END-TIME for more information. In case you're just joining us, wonderful, wonderful news. We are now... $14,200 away from our goal for our translation project. Uh, we are at $105,827.66. So if you want to help us go over the top, we only have $14,000, a little less than $200 to go. So $14,200, and we're done with this project, which means that the Understanding the End Time 14 hours of DVD will be translated into... Chinese, Russian, Arabic, Spanish, French, Hebrew, Italian. 90% of the world will be able to hear this information that God said in 550 B.C. I'm going to place this information in the hands of the end time generation. Well, that's what we're working on right now. Now, I'm not making any big boast. All I can tell you is I don't know anybody else in the world doing this. I don't know anybody else in the world that's taken the prophecies that Jesus specifically said he would put in the end time generation and making it available not only in English, but in most all the languages of the world. So we are really thankful. We're really excited. And we're also very grateful for what you have done to make this possible. Let's finish it out. If you are able to give toward this cause, please do, whether it's 10,000, 5,000, 1,000, 500, 100, 50, 25, 10, whatever you can do, you know what you can do. Please do it. Don't wait. And we appreciate it so very much. We're getting ready to wipe, to wrap this thing up. Let's get back to our phones now and calling from Louisiana. Hello, Daniel. All right. Hey, Brother Baxter. Thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. Uh, I have a quick uh, kind of comment question because I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, and what you're talking about today with uh, the, the homosexuals and the way some people say they're born that way, I, I've thought about that before, and uh, it, it's come up in Bible classes as well, that question. And uh, me personally, uh, before I, I was born again, uh, I realized I had a lot of traits that came from my father who wasn't born again, and uh, some of those things with with perversion and and desiring alcohol and things like that. And I could see very clearly that I was my father's son until Jesus Christ delivered me from the, uh, the strongholds in my life. And when it comes to homosexuals, I've wondered, you know, is it possible that those are generational spirits that are passed down just like a, a baby being born a crack addict or addicted to drugs? Uh, because of uh, choices its parents made or, you know, its mom. Uh, so 
I'd like to hear your comment on that, maybe what you think about it, and uh, I'll hang up and listen. Okay. God. God bless you. Good question, Daniel, because there's a lot of teaching these days about generational curses. Let me tell you what the Bible says about that. Uh, this is Ezekiel chapter number 18, and it starts out there in verse 2. What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right, and shall not have eaten upon the mountains, and he lists a whole lot of other things he shall not have done. If he does what's right, then he will receive what's right. If he does what's wrong, he will receive what is wrong. So the scripture is very adamant here. I will not allow you to use this proverb. The fathers have eaten sour grapes and set the children's teeth on edge. Now, that does not, though, eliminate the fact that families have powerful influence. If you're raised in a particular environment where certain attitudes from the day you're born, are they going to affect you? Certainly they're going to affect you. Now, they will either cause you to pick up those same traits or to hate those traits and to run away with them and make sure those are not part of your life. I've seen both things happen. I've seen one young man raised in a family go right in the footsteps of his, his dad. His dad was alcoholic. He became an alcoholic. But I've seen another young man in that same family say, I will not walk in those footsteps. I've seen the devastation that produces, and he makes a decision. I'll get as far away from that as I can get, and he does. So it's important to realize. Now, uh, of course, the Bible teaches that when Jesus Christ came, that we might be born again. We all have a sinful nature. Are there any elements of the sinful nature of a father or a mother that's passed on to a son or a daughter? I suppose there could be. But the big key is we all now have available to us the plan of salvation called being born again. And the Bible says, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. If you're out there and you feel like the way you were raised is sucking you under, I understand what you're saying, but don't give mental assent to that. Do not yield to that because you don't have to. Instead, get to a Bible-believing church be born again, biblically born again. If you want to know what that means, we have a free brochure. What do you mean born again? If you would re prefer to download it from our website, go to endtime.com. On the right-hand side, you'll see a question that says, what do you mean born again? Click on it. There's the article. I took time to write it because I felt like it's the most important single question on this planet. So what I'm telling you is that even if you find yourself sucked into the the modes of conduct of your family. You don't have to accept that because Jesus Christ came to break that yoke and to deliver us from the proverb, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and set the children's teeth on edge. And now he said, you can be born again. And just because your dad or your mother lived a certain way, and perhaps they were immoral or they were alcoholic or they were drug users, that does not mean you have to follow that footsteps because God has made a way of escape for all of us. And the way of escape is called being born again. So when we talk about Immorality, uh, sexual promiscuity, alcoholism, drug addiction, lying, cheating, dishonesty, homosexuality, whatever you want to talk about. All of those are sinful traits that we must purge from our lives in order to have salvation. The Bible teaches, do not be deceived that neither adulterer nor fornicator nor effeminate let me tell you, if your boys 
are developing in effeminate traits or your girls are developing masculine traits, you need to get alarmed quick. I'm talking about when they're two and three years of age, don't allow that to happen. Steer them in the right direction. Uh, don't if, if that boy has feminine traits, don't teach him how to crochet. Don't have him in the kitchen all the time with you. Put him out there with his dad, mowing the grass, working. You need to instill because traits are taught. Masculine traits are taught. Feminine traits are taught. If you're in a broken home situation where your son is all the time around females, you need to find a way. Get in a good church where he can get some male peers, some other young men. Purposely make sure he runs with other young men that are masculine. If there's another young man in the group that's feminine, don't let him run with that person. Let that person run with someone else that will help him. But you make sure that you steer your boy or your girl in the right way. And the Bible says train a child up in the way it should go. And when it's old, it will not depart from it. I've seen people that could have developed feminine traits as far as a man is a young man is concerned or masculine traits as far as a young woman is concerned and i've seen parents foolishly joke about it and think it was cute and feed that fire only later to have horrible heartbreak uh, whereas on the other hand i've seen people that were wise and said no you're not doing that you come go with me you get i've seen mothers say to their sons get out of the house go go help your dad and they were training those. And that's a difficult thing in this day of broken homes. That's the reason God hates divorce so bad. And I know some of you are in divorce situations, perhaps no fault of your own. And I'm not trying to add pain to your heart. I'm simply talking about things that our nation, is it time for the United States of America to put the stamp of approval on sodomy? God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for the sin of sodomy. And we're going to crow about it. We're going to get on NPR. I was listening to NPR. I was listening to C-SPAN today. Had a big program on there about that. We're going to get on there and act like we're so wonderful because we are putting our stamp of approval on something that God detests and hates. America, America, wake up. You think you're wise in your own conceits, but you're not. It's a mistake. I don't want to hurt you, but I'll tell you what, we need to let God be God. We're acting like we're God. We're smarter than God. We know how to build a model society, but this model society we're building is headed straight for a horrible disaster. And when I say it, it pains me to say it, but it is in fact the truth. Okay. Okay. Well, heavy subjects, a lot going on today. World government is gaining by leaps and bounds at the United Nations in New York. Uh, don't ask, don't tell has now been. Now I'm not saying that don't ask, don't tell was a good policy. If you're going to allow the gays to be in, don't put them in that bind. Uh, I'm not saying one way or another. I'm talking about the issue of of being gay itself, of homosexuality itself. I, I'm willing to say that's wrong. I do not believe it's right though to misuse people, even people that are wrong. It's not right to misuse them as Christians. So God help us to do the right thing. Well. Uh, don't forget our translation project. Uh, we're almost over the top. Please do what you can. If you'd like to help us, give us a call 1 800 end time or go to endtime.com. God bless you all. I'll see you tomorrow. Politics and Religion is a production of End Time Ministries. We are a daily one-hour broadcast dedicated to bringing you the prophetic fulfillments happening every single day. If you would like to listen to archive programs, subscribe to End Time Magazine, find a prophecy conference, order End Time products, or subscribe to our free weekly e-newsletter called 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com and take advantage of everything that the website has to offer. To be a part of End Time Ministries, partner with us and help this message go to the entire world. End Time Ministries is a partner-supported ministry. We'd like to take a moment to thank all of our loyal partners and listeners 
for helping make politics and religion and end time ministries possible. If you'd like to have a copy of today's program, you can obtain it by simply calling us at 1-800-END-TIME, or you can go to our website, www.endtime.com. You can either order the physical product from there and it'll be shipped to you, or there's also a place there for you to digitally download it and you can have it within minutes and be enjoying it in the privacy of your own home. I'm so excited to announce to you our 14 lessons making up our Understand the End Time Prophecy series. Our 14 lessons now include the United States discovered in the Bible, New World Order is World Government, Islam in Bible Prophecy, World War III, Israel's God-given destiny, Israel, God's prophetic time clock, Holy Roman Empire reborn, Antichrist and the false prophet, 666 Mark of the Beast, the secret pact between Gorbachev and the Vatican, when all religions become one, the seven trumpets, the second coming, and the kingdom of God established on earth. You want to have all 14 of these marvelous prophecy lessons. If you go through these 14 DVDs, each of them one hour, you are going to know more about Bible prophecy than the average student graduating from theological seminary. We need to know where we are right now. Jesus Christ said, I tell you these things before they come to pass, so that when they do come to pass, you might believe. So the number to call is, one more time, 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463, or go to endtime.com. You can now have all 14 Understanding the End Time DVDs filmed in End Time's TV studio with green screen technology using beautiful full screen graphics. All 14 hours are just $1.99. Go to endtime.com or call 1-800-END-TIME right now.